Hi class, uh, for this one I'm going to be showing myself, so I'll wave to the camera. Um, I'll try it out, and if I don't like it, then I might just use my voice. But I thought you guys could see me and uh, make it more of a lecture. So today we're going to talk about the history of uh, engineering, and specifically civil engineering and architecture, um, which I think is a really important concept. Whether you enjoy history or not, I think it's really important to know the beginnings of it um, in order to have an idea, you know, where do you come from in order to understand the future. Um, and kind of see the progression of each of these careers throughout time. Um, I think it's important that you also take a second right now to think, uh, what do you know about the differences between civil engineers and architects? Um, if I asked you, um, what does each one do? Do you know the answer to that? Um, we're going to talk about their similarities and differences, like I said, so let's get going. So the way I think of civil engineering and architecture and the differences between the two is a uh, civil engineer um, is responsible for doing anything that relates to civilian life. So whether that includes buildings, dams, roads, um, maybe the soils that we're on, um, they're going to be more responsible for the actual um, math and science-based calculations related to those things. Architects, however, are the designers. Um, they're the ones that are coming up with the actual visual display or the actual uh, appeal of it. Um, it's really, they both have the same common goal of making products that are going to be used for individuals to live. Um, the difference is one is using their math and science background, whereas the other is using more of their artistic um, background to be able to design it. Um, I think it's important to note, um, it's not going to be on any PowerPoint, but just some background. Civil engineering and architecture were actually uh, synonymous um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, the truth is that both, depending on what location you lived in, essentially did the same thing. Um, until math and science really became a big part of designing structures, um, you could say an architect was an engineer, you could say an engineer, a civil engineer was doing architecture. Um, civil engineering actually wasn't even coined until like the late 1700s, maybe early 1800s. So before that, everyone was either just kind of a civil engineer, architecture, all grouped into one. Um, so the beginnings of engineering itself was obviously related to just being able to survive. Um, if you think of what an engineer is, they're an innovator or inventor. Um, so, you know, back in the day when we basically didn't have much of anything, I mean, innovation came in the form of survival. I mean, how did you get food? What kind of devices did you come up with? What kind of structure did you live in? That all relates to engineering. Um, in terms of uh, building materials, um, materials were chosen based on availability and climate. So, um, you know, if we think of Greece or whether we think of um, other locations like Machu Picchu, um, if you think of locations like uh, China or even Japan, um, all those structures were built with what was available to them. Um, you know, in Machu Picchu, uh, which I went to recently, um, we see all these giant stones. If you go to Japan, you see a lot of wood structures. That's because that's the type of material that was available there. So that actually leads to the first key term I want you to make sure to note. That's vernacular architecture. That's when your construction is based and driven by the availability of resources and traditions around you. So, I mean, think of these locations. When you think of Japan or China or a lot of parts of uh, Asia, what type of building do you imagine? When you think of Africa, what type of building do you imagine? When you go to France, what type of homes do you think people live in? Or even as a place like, uh, you know, Alaska or, you know, like the North Pole. What do you imagine? Something as simple as it may seem weird, but an igloo is vernacular architecture because the people that lived there, the Inuits, had to survive with the snow that they had available to them. Um, and, you know, their innovation in design actually kept them warm and survived. So the first key term I'm going to underline is vernacular architecture. Make sure you know that. Some different examples of it, um, you know, whether it was, um, you know, whether science, uh, Southern African uh, Rondevel or Banda, um, you know, those are different examples of it. Um, the pyramids are also um, an example of vernacular architecture, but it also brings up a new word um, that we're going to go ahead and make sure to uh, note, which is a bearing wall. A bearing wall is a wall that's used to support not only the weight of itself, but also the roof above it. Um, bearing 
walls um, basically mean that um, you can bear the weight of other objects uh, rested on it. We'll notice that the pyramids um, used bearing walls, um, but not only just in Egypt, but also in uh, a place like uh, Mexico where this uh, pyramid is located. Um, we also notice modern day pyramids, um, whether it's the Louvre in France or um, I think this is a music museum in like Kentucky or something like that, um, modern examples. Uh, something that um, you're not going to see here, but I'm going to write it, um, post and lintel. Um, what that means is um, this is the original kind of idea of this. Posts that are supporting something above it. The post is the actual column. The lintel is what it's supporting. So something like the Parthenon. Um, this is a great example of a post and lintel. Um, this is an example of a, a term that's used um, to describe any time uh, columns are basically holding up a, uh, a structure above it. Um, the problem is you're kind of limited in terms of how much you can do with this basic shape. So there's another innovation that they came up with, which was the arch. So arch is simple enough. Um, it's just, you know, just like a McDonald's arch. Um, that was an, innov an innovation that came about in civil engineering. Um, or architecture, however you want to call it. Um, the Romans developed this, and um, there's a couple key phrases I want you to know. Um, the voussoir, which is spelled V-O-U-S-S-O-I-R, um, those are the parts that kind of hold this arch up. So it's basically the little individual components of the arch. The keystone is the part at the very top. So the keystone would be um, the very, I guess, the, the peak or the max of the actual arch itself. The vault is just a continuation of it. It's almost like a, a cave if you think about it. Um, you have to think of the fact that this is an innovation. Someone had to come up with the vault. So someone came up with first the arch, and then someone said from there, OK, why don't we create the vault? That's what a lot of modern caves are these days. Um, it might be called the vault, or if they connect, um, you can call them, uh, if they're if they're caves that cross, um, like the one we just saw, it's called a cross fault. This right here is a dome. Um, if you think of what a dome is, it's just a bunch of connected arches, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, so think about that. I'm going to go through this part a little quicker, but something like the Pantheon, their innovation was their materials that they used. They kind of created the first concept of cement. Um, so they used volcanic ash, lime. Um, and some water. They combined those materials and it created a hardened product that they went ahead and slabbed onto the walls or kind of grouped up together and then finished. Um, it kind of led to the innovation of what we call today like a Portland cement or concrete that we have. Um, the Colosseum is another example of that um, where they use that type of material. Um, and it still stands today, which I think is important to know. I mean, although the Colosseum is uh, you know, not the same as it used to, so the left is the before, the right is the after. Um, it still stands and you can still go into it, which considering how long it's been is quite an amazing. Great Wall of China is another great example of uh, architecture and design. Um, the aqueducts, um, the, the Roman uh, aqueducts is another important innovation. Um, start thinking about how all these things in history, someone had to invent. I mean, we take it for granted um, that, you know, these things just exist. But someone had to come up with this, and this was a method for transporting water. I mean, today we look at it and we say, like, wow, it looks really beautiful and really cool, but it serves a purpose before. And that was to transport water from a high location down to the bottom. Before we had the pipes, you know, now we have pipes that carry water across. Well, this is how they got water from, uh, you know, higher location down to the rest of the city. Um, road systems, um, you know, they had to design roads. I mean, take we, Again, we take it for granted, but, you know, before we just cleared dirt and we just had road, you know, clear dirt. Now we have developed roads that people created where, you know, uh, horses could ride a little faster. Eventually, nowadays, cars could go faster on, um, you know, something like a carriage on a dirt road would be very hard if there's a bunch of rocks in the middle, large big rocks. But if you have a clear kind of paved way for someone to ride a carriage, well, it's, you're gonna be able to get from point A to point B a lot faster. Um, early bridge designs existed, um, but it was really pioneered by the Romans. Um, after the fall of the Romans, 
they started making iron uh, bridges, which is one of the things that it shows here. Um, but, but nowadays, if we go to modern day, we skip a few hundred years and we get into structural steel. Um, think of the fact that um, we're able to big, build taller uh, buildings um, bigger than ever. I mean, buildings are getting to a level where, um, you know, you can't even see them above the clouds. We also have reinforced concrete that helps us get even higher and higher. Um, and reinforced concrete bridges that can carry more weight and carry more people and span larger spans. Um, all this comes from the original innovations of our original engineers, which I think is so important to think of the history and realize that civil engineering and architecture were really the same thing. Now, um, again, it all spans from helping people, civilians live, civil engineer. We're doing civil things like roads, bridges, uh, you know, waterways and everything that relates to survival. Um, and architects are essentially doing the same thing, but they're just focused on a different aspect of it.